I've heard nothing but good things about Jason Clark. I am absolutely pumped in anticipation to see what he has to say to us today. From what I understand, Jason, you've gone from high school dropout to mentor of the big end of the business. So without further ado, Mr. Creativity from Minds at Work, Jason Clark. Arc, 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 arc. I hope you're not expecting any singing or interpretive dance because it feels like it. Um, I should just say right off the bat, uh, I'm not an engineer, so, you know, shoot me. Uh, I'm someone who's, my background is, was originally in sort of uh, media and then in communications and event management, and then I fell into advertising for a little while, but I'm all better now. Um, and basically, my, I've spent my life really stuck between the creative minds and the practical minds, you know, working with the big picture people and then working with the hardcore detail concrete people and madly trying to get them to love each other and work together. And the last 15 years, that's dragged me sideways into the whole concept of innovation. So what does it take to stimulate ideas and how do we turn them into real change? So that's what my mission has been for the last 15 years. And the goal really is to make a future that works, you know, to find a better future and let's, let's just make it. Let's just stop talking about it and get on with it. Uh, so for my clients, innovation means, you know, better products and services, but to me it could mean uh, better communities, better engagement, better workplace, sustainable future, big picture stuff. What I call the Miss World end of stuff. You know, we should all just be getting along, it should be terrific. Um, so what I want to do is to show you the way I approach that, what seems to work with all the different professions and disciplines I've worked with, but also I, I'd like to think about I think engineers have a key role in this future that I'm talking about. And I don't say that to any group, I've saved this one just for you. Okay, uh, to me when we talk about innovation or change or making anything better, I always feel like we're trying to get across this gap. You know, it's this huge chasm between where we are, what we have right now, and where we want to be, what we'd like the world to be. Does anybody recognise that gap? Do you feel it? There's this huge, huge space. So what happens is we go to a conference and someone gets up and says, yep, we've got to do it, we've got to change. Maybe you watch a couple of TED Talks and you get totally, totally pumped. You think, yes, we're going to do it. And then you go back to the workplace and you think, nah, it's not going to happen. Have you had that sort of experience where you get yourselves all jazzed up and you think, no, I can't change anything in this place, let alone the future. So I want to show you what the process is, at least from my perspective. The first thing, I, I guess, is to try and figure out what's not good enough. You know, uh, Edison said that necessity was the mother of invention, but irritation was the father. Being annoyed by something, being intelligent, passionate, well-informed, and slightly pissed off is actually how you create change, right? So what is it that's not good enough? What is it that's letting us down? In fact, you know that um, James Dyson said recently, we only hire irritable people. You know, we don't want complacent people. We keep pushing and saying, it should be better, it could be better. George Bernard Shaw said, all human progress depends on the unreasonable. I know what he means. So we start asking this question, what's letting us down? Is it our processes, our products, our services, our relationships, our mindset, the way our profession thinks about itself, the way it behaves? Is there anything on that list? Just give me a, give me a yes or no. Is there anything on this list that needs changing? What do you reckon? Gee, the energy's phenomenal. You're absolutely right, right? There's stuff there that needs fixing, right? But surveys show that when you begin in a place and you say, why do we do it like this? Have you had that exchange? First three weeks on the job. You watched the way things were and you thought, really? This is how we do it? They're kidding me. And you said to someone, why do we do it like this? What answer did you get? Oh, it's just the way we do it around here. That's your answer? The, the classic one is, you're new here, aren't you, sweetie? It's, it's just a way of saying, no, nothing's going to change. So getting irritated and staying irritated is crucial if we're going to create anything better. So let's say the next step is to imagine is to say, what's next? What could be instead? Paul Keating, when he launched his book the other day, he said the key notion to leadership was to imagine something better and then convince people to follow you to that place. It's a nice definition of leadership. Without a vision, without an alternative, where am I going? Yeah? It's like I've got a, quite a few friends who are involved in the Occupy the Cities movement, and the problem is they're really hard to follow because they don't really have anywhere for us to go. You know, for a couple of weeks there, the chant was, what do we want? We're not sure. When do we want it? Whenever. You know, like... <laughs> <laughs> Not quite sure I can get behind you guys. Okay, this is where normally we ring up the engineers and the architects and the planners and the schemers. We say, we've got all these wild ideas, can we turn them into something? Can we make them fit in the real world? Can we bring them down from Neverland and make them fit in this space by this time? Would you agree that this is a different kind of thinking? The thinking that does that 500 year plan, great big idea thinking, that's the thinking that six year olds do. 
There's a lovely saying in Zen, nothing's impossible for the man who doesn't have to do it himself. When you get to design, though, you're going, geez, how do we make this fit? How does it actually fit in that space? Do you agree at some stage we have to have this kind of conversation? Prove it. What would it look like? How would it work? How would we pay for it? What about the legals? What about OH&S? At some point, we've got to start testing the ideas. And you would probably see that as build and test. Right? You put something together, you see whether it stacks up. If it doesn't, you go back to the drawing board. Does this make some sense so far? This is the basic rhythm. Yeah? And then at some point, you want to make a decision and get on with it. And here the questions are, what's the objective? What's the, what's the uh, deadline? And what's the freaking hold up? Let's go. And you can see that each one of these is a different way of thinking. And what's extraordinary in 15 years of working with pretty much every discipline, every profession, it doesn't matter whether you're an engineer or a teacher, it doesn't matter whether you make aeroplanes or laws, there seems to be a basic truth that this is what happens. We start with irritation, dissatisfaction, we get creative, then we get practical if we design, then we test the thing to death and if it survives, we get on with it. And if we come out the tail end with something that works, we then do it again. We go through an innovation cycle Imagine, develop, evaluate, act. And I'm sure you recognise this because all professions, all disciplines, all trades and all businesses recognise this is basically how it works. And do you know what? This is how change will happen, but there's so many things in the way. This is how teams actually work. All of my clients have their people organised in, in hierarchies, you know, those top-down siloed hierarchies. What we do is we figure out where's the talent and where do we put it. And so it doesn't matter what someone's job description is. It doesn't matter what their discipline is or what they were trained to do. It doesn't matter what they're paid to do. The question is, what are they capable of? Yeah? So if it turns out that that gal is the receptionist, but she's got the ideas, then as far as I'm concerned, that's where I go for ideas. We see this with CEOs. They'll say, look, the CEO might be in a, a, a sort of an evaluative position, and they'll say, I'm supposed to provide the vision for this company. The shareholders want one, the staff want one. I've got nothing. I'm getting delusions. That's all I'm getting. Okay. In fact, I'll show you how easy this is. We do this with organisations where they give us people that nobody wants to work with. Check this list here. This is the fish that John West reject. And the HR guys will say, we can't do anything with these guys. And we'll look at them and say, well, do you know what? You've got a perfectly good nut job there. This is someone who thinks so far outside the box, they don't even know where the box is. I think they would be really useful in thinking big. And while we're at it, You've got a pretty good empire builder there, quite a good schema with a bit of a Dr. Evil touch. I think that could be really useful in design. And I love your cynic. I know just the place for the cynic. You know, get him away from the butcher's paper hugs and the unicorns and rainbows and 500 year plans. Let's get him testing ideas for faults. He's going to be terrific. And you've got a drone who's just sitting there waiting for instructions and can't, can't wait. Let's go. And what's amazing, 15 years experience has shown me, when you start to build teams like this, you get cultures that automatically organise. All the lunatics find each other, all the cynics find each other. And you don't need Myers-Briggs and you don't need Herman Brain and you don't need coloured hats. You're saying, let's use the talent that we've got. Let's see past the job description. Let's see past the training and the discipline and say, what talent do we have and how do we orchestrate that talent? And this is important for my clients. I mean, this is the thing that we've learnt, that every psychological disorder is its own job description. The thing that makes people unbearable is actually what makes them wonderful. So instead of changing people or retraining, for 15 years the brief we've got is, can we change the way our people think? And I've learned to say, no, we don't need to. The way they think is terrific. You just don't know how to use it. Isn't that great? Because you know what happens? We, get, we, get, we come into a line of work and we bring three parts of us to the job. When we first start, we bring our heart and our mind and our body, don't we? We say, I want to work hard, I want to think big, I want to care a lot. But what happens if an organisation says, we're not interested in your ideas? And actually, I'm not really interested in your passion either then the heart and the mind get left at the door and just the body turns up to work. This is what De Bono said. This is why he's got an island in Malta. He said, when you hire someone, be careful you're not just renting their body. If you listen to them, really listen to them, you'll get their hearts and their minds for free. Okay, so guess what happens in organisations where we just build people into silos? This is a design studio that I know. Guess what their problem is? Not enough ideas and a real incapacity in getting things done because it's a room full of designers. They're waiting for the client to tell them what the idea is. Does that ring any bells? No? Here's a real estate firm that I know. Guess what their problem is? Everyone's just waiting to get out and sell someone. No, no one's prepared to think about what's the future of the industry, and they're going down the drain because it's all happening online. Yeah? This is a publishing company that I know. Look at the poor bastard in the middle there trying to figure out how do we make this business work. I've got all the dreamers on this side, what we call the fiction department, and I've got the sales guys over here, which is the non-fiction department, and there's this poor bugger in between. This is a bank. Does that surprise anybody? 
You've, you've got every critical thinker, every black hat in the room, you've built an entire organisation out of them. We were working with their board, and it was hilarious. There's 20 guys, like there's 15 guys in the room, and they're all the same guy. It's 15 copies of the same mind. And, and they said, we're trying to find ways of cutting costs. I've got, I've got a ripper of an idea. I think we only need about two of you, and we'll get some other people in here. <laughs> so you see what happens when we put people in silos? They don't think beyond that particular box. Do you guys see this happening in engineering? Because it's happening everywhere, and it stops us from creating change. The other thing that's really toxic is, is hierarchy. The boss's idea is always the best idea, even if it isn't. You ever seen this? And so if we decide that some people's contribution is more important than others, it's another block to change. Yeah? I, I've been in meetings where I've been the only person in the history of the company to say no to the CEO, and it's a big moment in their history. You know, like no one's ever done that before. And it doesn't matter whether the person on top is, you know, the, the sort of the evaluator, the tester ideas, or if it's the person who just has all the ideas. Very often we go into companies and clean up after what we call the charismatic leadership, where we've got a genius in charge and everyone's madly trying to run around and make the dreams come true. Okay, and there's the bank again. You can see what their problem is. Uh, not only have we got all kinds of people, we now have them in a stack. Okay, let me tell you why this matters. A lot of my clients are trying to solve some really serious problems. I was in um, uh, Adelaide yesterday working with the health sector. I don't know if you've paid any attention to what's happening in the health sector, but it's screwed, you know? And here's the reason why. Here's my very scientific map. In terms of the number of people in our society who need care, I don't know if this is news to you, but that's going up exponentially. Have you seen this happen? The number of people who need help is going way up. The number of people who give a damn is actually going down. Now, you're engineers. Tell me what happens when those two streams cross. And this is what happens. We're going to go from difficult to impossible, and there's a crunch, and here's where we are right now, and we're slowly making our way towards it. So you look at this and say, well, what we've got to do is to get more people to care and maybe, I don't know, kill off other people earlier or something. We've got to <laughs> bend, those, bend those bars, you know, try and get the parallel, try and get the lines happening that way. But you know what? This model isn't just about the care sector. Oil has exactly the same profile, as does water, food, land, fish stocks, law and order, education, health. All the areas we're involved in all have the same thing. The demand is going up and supply is going down. Have you noticed this? Now, this raises some really interesting questions about the next 100 years. This is why we need people to step up, people who can really see problems, analyse them and solve them with elegant, beautiful solutions. So I'm talking to you guys. Ah, okay. Here's some stuff, just in case you haven't been paying attention to what's happening in the world. Do you realise we produce four Australias worth of population every year? What's the capacity of this stadium? Is it 50,000 or 100,000? 50? That's how many people we make in four hours. We could fill that stadium every four hours. That's extraordinary. Right? That means every 15 years we make a new India and we haven't fed the last one. You can see the challenges. There's some big challenges for us. Now maybe the polys are fixing it, but I'm not quite so sure. Um, third, a third of the world's irrigation systems are in collapse. See, this is the good news part of the story. Uh, half the world's land is now desert. 25% uh, of the world's farmland is screwed. And about 66% of all farmland is in record drought, including here. And th almost a third of all world fisheries have collapsed. Yeah? Uh, what else is happening? Well, we're going to have to grow 70% more food by 2060. That's more food than we've grown in the last 8,000 years. You can see there's some challenges ahead for us. We need some smart people, and we need them now. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, demand that's growing 15 times faster on food supply than I uh, think. We've got 170 million people with nowhere to live right now. Are we going to build detention centres for all of them? We're going to need a lot, and they're going to have to be big, or we have to come up with some other way of thinking. This is why the creative thing is so important to me. It's not just about being artistic, it's about finding new ways to live, and the time couldn't be more, more pertinent. Uh, this is what a demographer said to me the other day. I thought this was really striking. Our grandparents had it tough, but they had it simple. Life was hard, but there wasn't a lot to know. We live in a period of incredible cushiness and wealth, but our life's complicated. Do you know what our kids' lives will be? They're going to be hard and complicated. Now, either we can leave it to them to fix, or we can start thinking about these things now. OK, so why am I bothering you with this? Well, if you take this notion of we imagine, we develop, and we evaluate, and we act, how does that sit in the world of problems and solutions? Well, here's the way that I see it. It starts when there's a set of conditions that generates a problem, which may in some eyes be an opportunity, right? Something is wrong, we need to think about how to fix it. Would you agree with that? There's an issue, right? Hopefully we go through this due diligence and we come out the back end with a new set of conditions that works. 
we come out with a smarter way of doing things. It's a better answer, it's a better future. We've gone from where we are to where we want to get to. What's the relationship of the engineer in this? Now, I've been asking doctors and lawyers and all the rest, but I'm particularly interested with you guys. What's your role in this? Now, the experience I've had working with engineers and engineering firms, to me, as an outsider, it looks like this. It looks like builders will make the plan happen. They will take the ideas out of the CAD CAM, off the paper, and convert them into concrete. The client will be the one who has the solution. They'll come up with the idea, apparently. What's the motto of Engineers Australia? If you can imagine it, engineers can make it so. Isn't that the motto? Well, what are we saying? We're not the ideas guys, we're the guys that make it happen. Someone else has got the ideas. I'm out there in the world of ideas and I'm telling you, there's nothing. No one's thinking. <laughs> and this is the amazing thing. I've learned not to care what other people think because I've realized they don't. <laughs> it's just, suddenly you're free, right? And it seems to me that the traditional concept of engineer is as some sort of bridge between an idea that someone will knock on our door and give us, and then the plan that will eventually become the new set of conditions. What I want to suggest to you is that we shouldn't be waiting for the brief. We should be setting the brief. It's, I think it's actually time for engineers to actually step up and see the whole picture. Because of all the disciplines that I've worked with, yours is the only one that I think is well positioned to project manage the rest of us. You are the one ring to rule them all, my friends. Yeah? <laughs> And so I think it's time for us to start think of engineers as thought leaders, not as someone who takes a brief and fulfills it to a client's expectation or puts in their billable hours. These are the thinkers. And what's interesting is this has already happened in history. In the 17th century, before there were TED conferences, in the 17th century, a whole bunch of architects and builders and planners got together and said, hey, we've built the great cathedrals, we've built the great temples, why don't we build the great cities and the great futures? Do you know who I'm talking about? The Masons. Right? They started this thing. They produced presidents and thinkers. They attracted Voltaire and Mozart and Goethe. These were artists and engineers and thinkers saying, let's create a future. And let's get our guys into power and do this thing properly. And then they got distracted by handshakes and aprons and they, they just went weird after that. But the thinking was still there. But what's incredible now, when I look at things like Engineers Without Borders, Doctors Without Borders, the Centre for Sustainability Leadership, the TED Conference, guess what? These are little Masonic orders popping up. But now they're okay with women and they're not sort of kinky about blindfolds and everything else. It seems to me that we're in a second Masonic stage, but this time we might actually get it right. But that was driven by engineers because they said, who else understands how to build and critique and analyze and to see whether something works? I wouldn't trust any other profession. I think this is a calling for you guys. We tried it once, we screwed up, let's do it again. Last thoughts. If you look at, uh, I saw a presentation by the president of the World Bank and he had this incredible thing. He said, if you look at what happens in the change in the world, it's like this, it's exponential. So social change, technological change, environmental change, it's going through the roof, would you agree? It's just getting faster and faster and faster. That's external change. What do you know about institutional change? The ability of governments and systems and regulations and all the rest of it to respond. Have you been following Durban, Kyoto, Copenhagen, we are so slow. It's amazing, one politician said, um, he would describe the progress on climate change as glacial, and an environmentalist said, have you seen the glaciers lately? <laughs> the glaciers are going faster than the people who are trying to save the glaciers. It seems to me it's time for some serious rethinking. And guess what, in that gap between the change that's happening around us and this sluggish way in which we respond, these are all the challenges that we're gonna face. So if you're waiting for the brief, I think this is the brief, my friends. I think this is the challenge. You know what needs to be done, and no one else is doing it. We need to think beyond just working for clients and meeting briefs and thinking, what do I need to do with my skills, with my passion, with my particular mindset? Uh, people tell me they haven't got time. In 15 years, I've been looking at where people's time goes, and here's my, here are my findings. Uh, does this look familiar to you? This is where a huge amount of time goes. How do we just stay out of trouble? How do we make sure that everyone's ticking over? How do we fight over territory and turf and all the rest of it? How do we figure out who's, who's with who in the office? And this seems like when, the, when your career is over, if you've ever dealt with idealists at the end of their career, and you start deducting all of those nonsensical things we spent our time in, and you realize there's this tiny, tiny little sliver, the few opportunities we had to create a difference, to me, that's not enough. We need to open this up. 
So here's my real last question for you. There's a great quote from Tolkien. He said, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that we have. I love that quote. It really cuts to the chase for me. That should be a tweet. Like, that's everything, right? So when it's all over, why did you do this? Why engineering? There are easier things to do. Why did you pick this? So when we really drop this thing up there, what's it going to say, right? Is this what you're hanging out for? Here lies me. I achieved all my key performance indicators and applied to all departmental protocols. Is that good enough for you? Is that a legacy you want to leave? Uh, this is popular. Is this good for anybody? I want to devote 40 years of my life to just kind of staying below the radar. Or this one. This is popular. Because you're dealing with the most important years of your life, yeah? I preserve the status quo. Anybody into that? Did you say, I really believe in engineering because it can keep things the way they are? I've never heard him say that. Right? This is what I hear. This is my chance to make a difference. This is my chance to take my passion and my intellect and my genius and actually apply it to create a real difference, a future that works. Does that ring any bells with you guys? Because here's the real choice. You've got to ask yourself, is that what you're actually doing? Is that what the profession is doing right now? Or is it simply taking a brief and keeping clients happy? Because here's the way I see it. And it's probably simplistic, but here it is. If you want to make a difference, you've got to make a choice. You can either make a difference or you can keep things the same, but you can't do both. It isn't possible for you to do both, so you've got to choose. Good luck. Thank you.